Hello. Welcome to another session of Digital Slide Review and Sign Out. I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel, coming to you from my warm office. Uh, and uh, I'm here on the University of Oklahoma Health Science Center campus. Our program is part of the Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy, uh, which is a joint venture of Digital Pathology Association, offering uh, free membership to international uh, applicants and to trainees and the uh, PATH presenter uh, website. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit today about uh, a GI uh, case. Uh, the uh, incident case uh, was a 72 year old woman who was admitted to the ICU and a few days later began to develop diarrhea. Uh, so uh, that led to uh, a combination of additional testing uh, among which was uh, some uh, lower GI endoscopy uh, to see if they could uh, quickly identify a uh, cause for this. And uh, the, uh, it's important to think about uh, kind of what we, what we should be thinking about in somebody who has hospital-acquired enteric diseases. In our setting, in a Western environment, Clostridium difficile is certainly the most commonly uh, encountered hospital-acquired uh, enteric uh, disorder that uh, presents with diarrhea or other changes in bowel habit. But there are a number of other causes, including rotavirus and novavirus, uh, that uh, can cause this as well. And uh, in other areas of the world, you may encounter a, a variety of other things, uh, salmonella, shigella, parasitics, and so forth. Um, although most of those, uh, with good hygiene and so forth have been uh, largely eliminated in many of those settings. So let's go right to the uh, histologic slides. And uh, here is kind of, uh, well, the gross appearance uh, of what might be encountered in this kind of a situation. You see here the lumen of the colon uh, studded with these sort of uh, slightly raised uh, pale yellow plaques, which sometimes have a little bit more tan appearance. And uh, you know, here, here in this sort of resected specimen, uh, you can see, and you might wonder, well, is this the normal mucosa and these are ulcers in between? Is this just ulcerative colitis? Um, but in fact, it is not. It, it's these little uh, punctate uh, exudative uh, areas which uh, uh, provide the clue to what's uh, uh, going on. Now, uh, the histologic findings can be uh, subtle at times, uh, depending on the stage at which the disease is biopsied um, and uh, the overlying, underlying uh, causes associated with the uh, presentation. So uh, we're going to focus here uh, right away on this area of the slide here. Um, and I'll uh, turn it so we can sort of look like uh, we're right side up here. Uh, and I think you can see right off that there's a distinct difference between the normal mucosa on either end and this area where the uh, mucosa is slightly raised. And uh, we have uh, what appears to be a little bit of uh, fibrin uh, coming off of the surface. And then this sort of uh, filigree of inflammatory cells and fibrin and mucin and epithelial cells sort of all coming off the uh, tuft or the epithelial surface. And in addition, as we look around, we see that these glands uh, show sort of a, a mixture of uh, loss of mucin, loss of, of cytoplasm, fragmentation of the uh, cytoplasm, and even a little bit of uh, associated atypia, uh, see some nucleoli and so forth. So this is a uh, kind of a very early stage of uh, uh, this process with this uh, very uh, kind of explosive uh, appearance off of the surface of the uh, colon. Um, and that defines kind of uh, uh, a pseudomembrane type of appearance. Now, most often, as I've mentioned, this is uh, C. difficile. Um, so when we make a diagnosis of pseudomembranous colitis, uh, we're usually thinking most likely C. difficile. Um, and the, this clinically presents uh, in a variety of ways. It can be kind of asymptomatic. So you can have people who are shedding this uh, disease, maybe at a low level uh, with fairly mild uh, lesions, such as those we just saw. Or they can have kind of a watery, foul-smelling diarrhea with some abdominal pain, maybe some cramping, and even fever. Um, 
On the other hand, you have to be aware that if they have abdominal pain and they don't have diarrhea, uh, particularly if they're in a high risk group, uh, this could indicate that they are developing an ileus with a so-called toxic megacolon. Because sometimes this uh, disorder can really kind of explode um, and you can actually present with a very rapidly developing fulminant colitis, inflammatory uh, uh, response syndrome or shock and so forth. Uh, that can lead uh, to death. Uh, and in fact, when you look at uh, uh, iatrogenic uh, deaths in the hospital or hospital-associated deaths, uh, this is certainly a, a serious cause to be uh, addressed. In terms of diagnostic testing, of course, uh, pathology, uh, surgical pathology is not the best method to test. This is going to take longer time. Uh, biopsy today, uh, results back tomorrow. Uh, that's going to be at least 24 hours. So actually the best single test, most rapid and sensitive and specific, is a PCR test for toxin B. Now, if you don't have a laboratory set up to do PCR testing, there are a couple of other options. Certainly immunoassays can assess for toxin production. Um, uh, and these are looking at the clostridial toxins um, that are cytotoxic and so forth. And you can also measure that in a cell culture, uh, looking at uh, whether or not the cells develop a cytotoxicity. Um, that, however, takes a little bit longer, up to three days sometimes. Um, stool cultures have been used at times, and a less direct test, sort of an indirect test of, uh, of clostridia is uh, the presence of glutamate dehydrogenase, but that's quite not specific. Now, I mentioned here that tissue is not specific, and why is that? Well, because these toxins uh, are not entirely uh, faithful to their, uh, their, their mothership in Clostridia. And in fact, they have been detected in a variety of other uh, enteropathogens, including uh, E. coli that have acquired toxin uh, secreting capabilities and uh, some Salmonella, Shigella, other organisms as well. And so sometimes culture is kind of the way you're gonna get to the right organism uh, in this situation. So I think it would be useful to kind of examine the spectrum of disease that uh, we can see with uh, Clostridia uh, and uh, this uh, disorder. Uh, this is uh, taking our case maybe back even a half a step further, uh, because I think this is like the smallest uh, pseudomembranous colitis uh, case I've ever seen. Uh, we have one little uh, patch of pseudomembrane here. Uh, this patient obviously has some melanosis coli. Um, but we can still see that we've got uh, some crypt damage, regenerative, atypical changes, and we've got this sort of explosion off of the surface, ulcerated area with fibrin, uh, inflammatory cells, and mucus, and loss of the uh, mucin. Now, uh, in cases more similar to those that uh, I showed you the gross photographs for, uh, this is kind of what you're going to see. Uh, spared areas uh, with these sort of mushroom cap uh, explosive areas uh, into the lumen uh, with uh, a mixture of inflammatory cells uh, in that uh, mushroom cap or uh, pseudomembrane. Um, and underneath it, you will see uh, wildly damaged crypts, uh, sort of withered, lost their, their epithelium or lost their cytoplasm, um, and maybe dilated with the ex excess mucin and so forth all leading into this uh, fibrin and inflammatory cap over and, over and above. And beneath that, sort of the transmigrating inflammatory cells that you'd expect in this, uh, a mixture of uh, plasma cells, lymphocytes, and some uh, acute inflammatory cells all getting drawn into the mix here. Uh, as that happens, you'll get fibrin deposition that can occur in the lamina propria and in the submucosa as well. So this is a very classic appearance uh, in a resected colon, uh, patient probably toxic and uh, septic that uh, needed to have uh, that emergent surgery to potentially forestall uh, death. Um, taking this a little step uh, uh, back, you can also see situations where uh, maybe you don't have that fully developed uh, mushroom cap in quite the same explosive sense, but you still have this pseudomembrane of fibrin and inflammatory cells along the surface. 
And then here we see that uh, there's been more time for inflammatory cell accumulation, uh, and you get an acute cryptitis with crypt damage. Um, and so this sort of a pseudomembranous appearance, uh, not as much uh, withering of the glands, uh, still a little bit is present here, and obviously this transmigration of inflammatory cells, along with edema, vascular congestion, other secondary changes that you might expect to see here. Uh, when the disease becomes more confluent and fulminant, uh, it can look like this, and you get uh, essentially a massive ulceration and a confluent pseudomembrane. Um, and as we look here, uh, we'll see that uh, uh, we have a couple of things. Well, first of all, this is a renal uh, failure patient who has some k exalate crystals in their bowel, uh, but those aren't the cause of the uh, uh, pseudomembranous colitis. Uh, but here you see this mixture of uh, dilated, uh, almost empty glands with uh, mucin and inflammatory cells and withered small uh, epithelial lining cells, maybe with a few normal ones in between, a stroma that's uh, inflamed and has fibrin and edema, uh, and then again this surface cap of uh, fibrin, inflammatory exudate, uh, that is the uh, harbinger or the uh, namesake of the pseudomembranous colitis. Uh, so this is kind of a nice uh, a tour of some of the spectrum of changes that you can see from very subtle to overwhelming uh, circumstances requiring uh, resection. Um, now, in contrast, uh, I'm going to show this case, which uh, is not uh, clostridial uh, uh, disease, but is in fact ischemic colitis, which is oftentimes considered um, in the differential for pseudomembranous colitis. Because as you see here, you can get an area of sort of exudative uh, inflammatory membrane on the surface, so a pseudomembrane. And then beneath it, you have this fibrin and inflammatory cells, and you have the shrunken uh, crypts. Now, what you don't tend to get as much in this circumstance is the dilated explosive appearance of the crypts, but you get more fibrin. Uh, however, either disorder, depending on the degree and the exposure of the toxin, uh, can give you these changes. So uh, if you're getting a small biopsy and you're seeing these kind of changes, uh, the differential should always include uh, ischemic colitis as well as pseudomembranous colitis with these sort of withering glands. Um, and uh, sometimes I will use the term, uh, you know, toxigenic uh, enterocolitis, uh, but uh, this uh, uh, appearance of uh, withered glands um, is uh, frequently seen in ischemia. Uh, and of course, usually in the bowel, ischemia is going to affect a broad zone. Um, and so it's not going to be just a, a, an isolated uh, single patch. But as we've just seen, that sometimes uh, clostridial uh, or pseudomembranous colitis can become fulminant and broad based. And even here, we see a little area of relative uh, sparing uh, in the uh, uh, mucosa within this adjacent. Uh, withered gland appearance and hyalinized or fibrinoid changes in the uh, mucosa. So that's always in the differential and should be borne in mind. Well, uh, of course, clostridial uh, enterocolitis, pseudomembranous colitis has a number of predisposing risk factors which have been identified over the years. Um, early on, it was uh, recognized that exposure to antibiotics was a, a, a part of this uh, process, um, but it's not always seen. There still are uh, circumstances where uh, that is uh, very frequently the uh, predisposing factor, uh, and we'll go through that in just a minute. Uh, elevated age, exposure to other patients who may be shedding uh, clostridial uh, spores, patients who've undergone recent surgery, maybe got antibiotics related to that, or they're just living in the ICU for whatever reason, immunosuppressed and so forth. Now, gastric acid, uh, while the spores will, trans, trans, will, will pass through the stomach despite acid, uh, if the acid is reduced, that seems to probably increase the dose and or um, otherwise uh, enhance their ability to uh, uh, 
you know, desporulate and uh, become toxigenic. And then lastly, this is a relatively recently identified uh, risk factor pregnancy. Um, and it's not clear what all of the associations are there. Obviously, these are not going to be your old elderly patients that are pregnant. Well, just to kind of summarize the uh, pathogenesis, I like this little cartoon from medcomic.com, uh, which highlights the, the common uh, wisdom about this. So uh, all of us probably have some degree of uh, spores in our gut lumen. But when our normal flora is disturbed because of an antibiotic, well, that uh, this, you know, changes the balance between the spores and the uh, uh, good guys, the good pink bacteria, and allows these uh, bacilli to uh, uh, proliferate and to develop toxin and continue to develop spores and so forth. And that um, creates the uh, excretion of the toxins, the two toxins A and B, um, which then uh, drive the uh, lining epithelial cells crazy, eventually killing off some of them. Uh, and in the response, these cells, you know, try to wash it out with as much mucin and blood and fibrin as they can. Um, and that then leads to a kind of a watery diarrhea uh, with mixed inflammatory cells in the process. So you can see how uh, from one to the end, uh, that is a fairly coherent uh, uh, role for uh, the uh, pathogenesis of the uh, clostridium in this circumstance. Well, I hope you enjoyed that little uh, review of uh, pseudomembranous colitis and uh, the various uh, issues related to toxigenic uh, uh, clostridium difficile. Uh, we hope that uh, if you enjoyed this, that you'll uh, hit the like button and please subscribe so that you catch on to future releases. Uh, we have a lot of interesting content yet to uh, share and look forward to releasing those uh, as uh, we encounter interesting and good cases uh, with which to do that. And of course, if you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm always open to your comments and suggestions, uh, new topics you'd like to see us cover, and I'll look forward to hearing from you. So until next time, thanks so much for joining me.